your Bibles this morning. I hope you do. Open them up to Exodus chapter 18. We're continuing our walk through this great book. 400 years ago, the English poet John Donne uh, penned these words. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. And with those words, he... Uh, beautifully communicated what the scriptures point out to us over and over and over again, and that is that we need one another. Here at First Middleburg, we say that we need to share our lives, right? Shared lives give us the strength and support that we need to face life's challenges. No man, no woman is an island unto themselves. We all need the strength of our brothers and sisters in Christ. As we come to Exodus chapter 18, as Israel continues their journey from Egypt to the promised land, they have to learn to live as a nation with social order and administration. One person making every decision about every detail in the life of this traveling caravan of freed slaves was not going to be a recipe for success. They were going to have to learn to share their lives and that lesson was going to have to be learned at the very top. They were a free people, but they were far from an organized nation. Last week in Exodus 17, a group of people from outside the kingdom, the Amalekites, came looking for war. And we saw that Moses was incapable of keeping the staff lifted without the strength of his brothers by his side. This week in Exodus 18, another foreigner comes in. This one's not looking for war, though. This one comes looking for the truth. His name was Jethro. Let's look at Exodus chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel as people and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. So the word of the Lord had spread throughout the region, just as the song of Moses in Exodus 15 had said that it would. Verse 2, now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. So Moses apparently sent his wife and children back to Midian as the affairs of the Exodus began to heat up. So sometimes after, sometime after chapter 4, verse 24. And this would have freed him up to just focus on his, uh, the task at hand and freed him from family responsibilities. But before this happened, when his son was born, he named him Eliezer, which means my God is help. And by naming him Eliezer, Moses was expressing gratitude for the Lord for having rescued him from execution in Egypt. You remember that Moses had killed an aggressive Egyptian foreman. So, and so when he named his son Eliezer, he was reminding himself in perpetuity of God's faithfulness. And although Eliezer's name is related to Moses' first flight from Egypt, it takes on added significance in light of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. Verse 5, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. And then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and all the hardships that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. The Lord had delivered them. Literally, it's the Lord had rescued them. The, the theme of God's deliverance continues to be front and center in Israel's history. Four times in the next 10 verses, Moses will record that it was the Lord that had done it. Verse 9, and Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. Notice what he says, now I am convinced that the Lord is greater than all the gods the people worship. 
Verse 12, And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to, to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So Moses wants us to see that whereas Jethro may have been impressed with God previously, he had not made a decision to follow God, but now that he's heard the whole story, he has done just that. Thus we see the burnt offering, which would have been an animal completely burned on an altar as an act of worship and complete surrender to God. And the fact that it records all the elders participating clues us into the fact that this was a religious ceremony in which many people were invited to participate. And so Jethro, as he makes a decision to follow the Lord, declares his allegiance to the Lord is welcomed into the family, welcomed into the nation with a sacred meal of fellowship. So Jethro and Moses, before this happened, they were in-laws. Now they're brothers. Before, they were related by law. Now they are joined together by faith. It's a very significant passage of Scripture. And as we think about this passage of Scripture this morning, I want you to think about how God wants to use you in His kingdom. I want to challenge each and every one of us to think about how we can maximize our kingdom impact by sharing our lives and ministry with others. I believe that's a key lesson that we can learn from this text. Maximize our kingdom impact by sharing our life and ministry with others. And one of the ways that we do that is by learning to share our lives with others. So if you want to see conversion stories like Jethro's happen in your life, if you want to see conversion stories like Jethro's happen in your sphere of influence, you're going to have to learn to share your life with others. You're going to have to learn to build relationships with others who are far from God. Now, obviously, Moses was going to have to spend some time with Jethro. Jethro was, after all, his father-in-law. Regardless of how, about how you feel about your in-laws, you just have to spend some time with them every once in a while, right? But notice what the topic of conversation was when they get together. Moses is glorifying God for all that God has done in their midst. And God uses Moses' testimony of God's faithfulness to move Jethro's heart to declare his allegiance to God. God uses Moses' testimony of God's work of redemption to move Jethro to follow the Lord. Notice what he says. He says, now I am convinced. When you think about the story, Moses had fled Egypt, and then he goes and meets Zipporah, and then marries her, and so Jethro's got him a son-in-law. And Moses lives with them for a long time, decades. And then one day Moses shows up and says, hey man, God spoke to me. I saw God. Really? Tell me about it. Well, this bush caught on fire. Which bush? Well, it didn't actually burn up. So I can't show you the bush that got burned up. But so th this bush caught on fire, but it didn't burn up. And while it was burning, God spoke to me and said, go back to Egypt because I'm going to deliver the entire nation of Israel from Egypt and I'm going to use you to do it. I mean, you can imagine Jethro like, really? I mean, that, that's a pretty unbelievable story. And so Moses takes Jethro's daughter and their two sons and goes back to Egypt. And then as things begin to heat up, apparently sends his wife and two sons back to Jethro. And Jethro's heard a little bit because the story is spread throughout the region, but he shows up and then he talks to Moses and he gets a blow-by-blow -blow account of everything that's happened. And it's hard to argue with the fact that the Israelites, who once were slaves in Egypt, are now free. And Jethro says, now I'm convinced. See, God used Moses testifying of the redemptive acts of God to move Jethro's heart. Folks, listen, the gospel should always be a central point of our conversations. 
We should be willing and ready and eager to testify of God's work of redemption in our lives. To share the story of how Jesus Christ entered into human history, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death on the cross, rose in victory from the grave, and then because we cried out to him, he changed our lives. And the reason we should be willing to testify to the gospel, to the redemptive acts of God, is because the Bible teaches that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. It's not my eloquence. It's not my ability to argue. It's not all these different facts. It's the story of God's redemptive work through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10 teaches us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible actually teaches that the gospel as it's proclaimed is used by God to evoke faith in the lives of unbelievers. Certainly not everyone who hears the gospel is saved, but everyone who is saved is saved because they hear the gospel. Every single person here today that is a Christian is a Christian because you heard the gospel. You may have heard it in Sunday school. You may have heard it in vacation Bible school. You may have heard it because some strange dude came and knocked on your door at 7 o'clock on a Tuesday night as part of a church visitation program and wouldn't leave your living room until you gave him a hearing. But you heard the gospel. And when you heard the gospel, you believed the gospel. And because you believe the gospel, God changed your life. Everybody who was saved is saved through the preaching of the gospel. Some people read it. Some people hear it. But nobody is saved apart from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Folks, listen to me. If we want to see more gospel conversions in our church then we've got to have more gospel conversations in our community. You want to see more gospel conversations happen in your sphere of influence? There have got to be more gospel conversations taking place in your sphere of influence. And for us to have those gospel conversations with people who are far from God, we've got to learn to share our lives. Three things can need to happen. Number one, we've got to learn to meet up. You've got to spend some time with people. Right? You know, we live in a world where we've never been more connected than we are right now through social media. But we also live in a world where I think we've never been more separated from others. We have more friends on Facebook, but fewer friends in real life. That's a recipe for disaster. So meet up with somebody. Spend some time with someone. And while you're doing that, catch up with them. Actually listen to what's going on in the life of the other person. In verse 7, you see Moses and Jethro, it says they asked about the, each other's welfare. That, that Hebrew word there is the word shalom, which implies wholeness and health. There was a, a genuine concern with the other's well-being. So when you meet up, catch up. Ask the other person how they're doing, and then be willing to share how you're doing when they ask you. And then finally, celebrate. Celebrate what God's doing. Celebrate God's work of redemption in your life. Testify of the work of the gospel. Share your lives with others. I mean, a great place to start would be with your in-laws, but your neighbors, your family members, your coworkers, your fellow students, your small group members, those you serve on ministry teams with. Share your life. So we come to this text and we see this amazing conversion story of Jethro. And one of the reasons Jethro is converted is because he's come into contact with people that follow the Lord and the people that follow the Lord testify of the redemptive works of the Lord. When we continue reading in verse 13, we see a very important lesson that we can all learn as well. So verse 18, verse 13 of chapter 18 says, The next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. So Moses spends the entire day resolving disputes among the people. Verse 14, when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? What is this you're doing? Why do you sit alone from morning till evening? It's repeated. 
So Jethro is asking rhetorical questions to help Moses see that what he is doing is not healthy or effective. But Moses has an answer to Jethro. He says, and Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' intentions here are good. He is really trying to lead his people to follow God. Verse 17, Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you and you are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice and I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, Look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. So what we see here is Moses' father-in-law instructing him to delegate based on discipleship. Hey, pour into these men. You've been teaching them what's right. Now, find some men that are trustworthy. Find some men that won't take a bribe and allow them to make some of these smaller decisions and save yourself for the bigger decisions. So the future of the nation here is at stake. Just as Moses needed help to hold up the staff when the Israelites were fighting the Amalekites, so too does he need help to lead the people to follow God. He can't do it all on his own. Verse 23 says, if you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all this people also will go to their place in peace. If you do this, you will be able to endure. That's not just the words of Jethro here. This is Moses, after the fact, writing them as truth. For posterity's sake, Moses wants us to see. Moses was not going to make it on his own. Even he needs to share his life. Even he needs to share his burden if he is going to fulfill the calling that God has placed in his life. Verse 24, so Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. And then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. So one of our core values here at First Middleburg is this. Shared lives give us the strength and support we need to face life life's challenges. We say that over and over and over again. Shared lives give us the strength and support we need to face life's challenges. Listen to me. That's not just a Pastor Chris hobby horse. That's not just a first Middleburg saying. It is a very biblical concept. By allowing others into our lives, we actually allow God to pour his strength into our lives. So how do we do that? It well, starts by sharing our lives, but it continues as we learn to practice transparency with others. See, shared lives implies more than standing around in a Sunday school classroom shooting the breeze about the weather, the latest sports events, or even your hobbies. To share your life, you've actually got to open a window into who you are. And you got to be willing to listen to others as they do the same. you got to let others into your life. And that takes time. It's normally not going to happen the very first day you meet someone. But what happens in time is that conversations about the weather, conversation about sports, conversations about hobbies give way to testimonies about God's faithfulness. Give way to uh, testimonies about how you're praying what you're hoping God's going to do in your life or in the life of your family. Testimonies about how God has sustained you. Prayer requests and the sharing of burdens. So you practice transparency with others by allowing them into your life. You, you allow them to observe your life. It's not just what they see for a few brief moments in a small group on Sunday morning or some other day during the week. 
but you actually allow them to see you and get to know you. Folks begin to see what's going on. And when others observe your life, they can learn from you. They can pray for you. They can help you. They can be there for you. See, long before I was ever discipled as a Christian, I was taught what a Christian family was supposed to look like Because there were a number of Christian couples in the church where I was saved that invited me into their home, invited me to participate in their lives, allowed me to see how a godly husband related to a godly wife, how a godly father related to a child. It wasn't a formal process of discipleship. It was just them allowing me to observe their lives. And so long before the formal discipleship process started, I got a glimpse into what God expected of me. And every time we allow others into our lives, we allow them to learn from us. We also allow them to see us, to see when we need help, to see when we're hurting, to see when we need strength. So we have to let others into our life, and we have to be willing to let others give feedback to provide wise counsel. How many of y'all drove a car to church this morning or rode in a car? Everybody have mirrors on their car? Yeah, it's kind of the law, right? You know, you know why you have mirrors on your car? It's because we've all got blind spots. You know, we, we, when we're just driving down the road, we can't see what's immediately to our left behind us and immediately to our right behind us. And we can't see if anybody's right behind us when we're backing our vehicle up or even when we're stopped at a stoplight. So we, we, those mirrors are there to help us see what's around us because we all have blind spots. Folks, a car is not the only place you have blind spots. You have blind spots in your life, and you need others in your life to point them out. Every once in a while, we need someone to stop us from walking into traffic, right? Because we just aren't paying attention, and we'll just walk right out in front of a car if someone doesn't say something. This is why you need to share your lives with others. This is why you need to allow them to give feedback into your life. Because you don't have a perfect perspective on everything. Now, they don't either. But together, your perspective is better than it is on your own. And so we we have to be willing to share our lives with others. And then as we share our lives with others, and this is what's so impressive about Moses, is we have to be willing to make adjustments in life. One of the best places to begin to share your life and and, and begin to practice these kind of relationships is actually in joint ministry. If If you're struggling to build those kind of relationships, let me encourage you to sign up for a ministry team. Get plugged into our Vacation Bible School Find another place to serve in our church because you will build significant relationships with others and you'll have opportunities to share your life with others and they'll get a chance to see you and you'll get a chance to see them. But as you begin to share your life, you have to be willing to make adjustments. And that means you have to listen to others. They have perspective that you don't. They see your blind spots when you don't. Hey, young people, listen to me. I know when we're young, we think we see everything more clearly than everybody else in the world. I remember what it was like to be a teenager. I remember what it was like to be 22, 23 years old and think that I just knew everything. And I would just kind of blow my dad off or blow my mother-in-law off as just a relic from a previous generation. You don't understand how things really work. And I look back now, 30 plus years removed from those days, and I think, if I had listened to my mother-in-law, if I had listened to my father-in-law, I know I would at least have a lot more money in the bank than I do right now, right? It's amazing. 
They had perspective I didn't have. But I didn't always allow them to speak into my life. And when they did speak into my life, I wasn't always willing to make adjustments. So you have to be willing to listen to others. You have to be open to wise counsel. One of my mentors, good friend, his name's Rick Wheeler. He's preached here a couple of times. Many of you know him. He gave me some of the, uh, the most sage advice one time. I don't know that it was original with him, but when he said it, it clicked with me. He sat me down and he said, Chris, you may be the smartest person in the room, but you are never smarter than the room. There's tremendous wisdom there. And what he was doing is he was teaching me the power of collaboration because I'm kind of a type A personality, just get things done. It's always quicker to do it by myself. You know, let's, let's get her done, right? It takes effort and work to involve a bunch of other people in the process. But the beauty of collaboration is the process is always stronger. The end result is almost always better especially when it comes to ministry. You might be the smartest person in the room, but you're not smarter than the room. So you have to be open to wise counsel. That's what the whole book of Proverbs is about, reminding us that we don't have all the answers, but God has surrounded us with people that have a lot of the answers that we need. And if we'll just engage in some conversation and listen God will get us where we need to be. And I think it's very significant that Moses was willing to do this. I mean, think about it. God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. God had used Moses to do some very significant things. I mean, the ten plagues, God sent them through Moses. Israelites marching out of Egypt, they were following Moses. Parting the Red Sea, happened through Moses. Crushing the Egyptian army by closing the Red Sea, happened through Moses. Miraculous provision of drinking water in the desert, happened through Moses. Miraculous provision of daily manna and daily quail, happened through Moses. Victory over the Amalekites happened when Moses held the staff up. When did they lose? When the staff got lowered. Moses is a pretty significant person in this story, right? You can imagine, Moses just thinks he's got it all figured out. He's got all the answers. That's why he's judging everybody and deciding all these events. And then here comes Jethro, who just became a Christian the day before. He says, Moses... Why are you doing this? This is not good. There, there's a better way to do this. Now, if Moses was like a lot of us, he'd been like, um, dude, God's been speaking through me. God's been using me pretty significantly the last few months. You just need to stay in your lane. I know how to lead the nation. That's not what Moses did, did it? Now, Moses listened to wise counsel. He made adjustments when he got wise counsel. And Moses and the entire nation were better off as a result. I love that Moses includes this account. Because in doing so, he reminds us that none of us have arrived. We all need the strength of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We all need wise counsel in our life. One of the things I, I glean from this is that you can be pretty new in the kingdom and still make a significant contribution in the kingdom. You don't, you don't have to wait for a burning bush moment. You don't have to have been used by God for years on end before you can make a significant contribution to the kingdom. Jethro just made a significant decision to follow the Lord the day before. 
And already he's got enough wisdom in this particular area that he's able to instruct Moses. Well, that tells us Moses is willing to listen to wise counsel wherever it comes from. And it reminds us that we don't have to wait to make a significant contribution to the kingdom. So as we prepare to close this morning, your next steps are written there for you on the insert. Two questions. Who are you allowing to speak into your life? And into whose life are you speaking? Who are you allowing to speak into your life? And into whose life are you speaking? Folks, I need wise counsel. You need wise counsel. And the only way we get wise counsel is if we learn to share our lives with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I need this. Moses needed this. You need this. So let's take some steps of faith to build the kind of relationships with others that will allow us to rely on the strength of others. Now, if you're here this morning, you've been hearing me talk about Jesus and his work on the cross for weeks, maybe months. Maybe you've been hearing about this gospel of Jesus Christ for years. You know, the good news that Jesus Christ left the glory and splendor of heaven, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death on the cross where he paid the penalty for your sins and mine and then rose victoriously from the grave three days later. Maybe you've been hearing that over and over and over again, but there's never been a time in your life when you surrendered to the gospel, when you believe the gospel, when you embrace the gospel and ask God to save you. Maybe today needs to be the day where you say, like Jethro did, now I am convinced. And you make a decision to surrender all to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the very first step in building the kind of relationships that are going to help you get through life. Or maybe you're here this morning and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you don't have what we like to call a 2 a.m. friend in your church. See, that's how we know if we're really sharing our lives. You know, the, the diagnostic question we ask is, do I have any 2 a.m. friends in my church? Now, a lot of us have 2 a.m. friends. That person you're going to call in the middle of the night if your truck breaks down on the side of the road or your, your spouse has a medical emergency or your kid didn't come home from a football game. We, we've all got some 2 a.m. friends. The question is, do you have any 2 a.m. friends in your church? Because if you don't have any 2 a.m. friends in your church, well, what that tells me is you're not building the kind of relationships within your church that Scripture compels us to build. And so you need to take some steps of faith in the coming days, in the coming weeks, to get to know somebody, to share your life with someone, to open a window into who you are and allow them to open a window as to who they are. You can do that by getting plugged into a small group. You can do that by joining a ministry team. You can start that just by asking someone after church, hey, you want to go grab some lunch? I hear Big Dogs down the road has amazing wings. Let's go watch the Gators beat Baylor in softball, eat some wings and get to know one another. I mean, it's as simple as that. that that's, a, that's a legitimate step of faith. Just get to know someone else and begin to share your life with them. And you'll find very quickly the strength and support you need to face life's challenges. Because when you refuse to build those kind of relationships, you rob yourself of the strength that God wants to give you. Because one of the key ways that God is present in our life is through the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song of response. And as I do, I just want to invite you to come forward if you need prayer. Maybe you're here and you want to talk to someone about what it means to follow Jesus. Maybe you're here and you just want to come forward and, and, and with the Lord, as others pray for you, you want, to, you want to declare to the Lord, you're going to take that step of faith and you're going to begin to build relationships with others and share your lives. Whatever your need is this morning, God's met that need in Jesus. You just need to receive it by faith. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you and we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for this opportunity to gather. And Lord, I pray that as we continue in worship, you would help us to respond to you in faith and just say yes to whatever it is you're calling us to do. Yes, Lord. 
And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing this morning? If you have needs, you come forward as we do.